Hi, my name is Zach McGee. I'm the chairman of New Media Legal Publishing, the sponsor of this CLE program. The presenter of this program is Andrew Struve. Andy was a brilliant, experienced, and highly successful litigator here in Southern California. On a personal level, he was also a warm, caring, and infectiously funny human being. Sadly, Andy passed away in July 2023 after a brief illness. The program you are about to watch was recorded a few years ago, but I've confirmed that the content still reflects the current state of the law on this topic. Reposting the program allows lawyers like you to continue to benefit from Andy's wisdom, and it allows those of us who knew Andy well to keep him around us for at least a little bit longer. I hope you enjoy it. Hi, thanks for joining. I'm Andrew Struve from the Buckhalter Firm in uh, California. And uh, I have had the uh, honor of presenting many presentations on legal ethics over the course of the last few decades. And I thank you for joining me uh, today for this one. And so our subject matter today is dealing with unethical adversaries, co-counsel, and even clients who don't honor the rules. Uh, and so we have a number of subtopics within that, but I'll try to give you some tools of experience as to how to handle such situations. And so one thing we'll look at as an overview is aspects of practice where bad ethical behavior often occurs. And so We'll start from the inception of the relationship, okay? And that involves the formation of the lawyer-client relationship and how that relationship is formed, right? And so <clears throat> if it's an existing long-time client, you have a trust relationship, you know how they do business, you know what their internal ethical standards are, that makes it substantially easier. You will be stunned and amazed to know that different organizations have different internal ethical standards, right? But it's a very important thing for you as the counsel to learn in the beginning of the relationship to the extent possible. With a new client, it's not that easy. So you have to take uh, the information you get in the beginning uh, and use it to model the relationship, right? Because as an outside counsel, you want to model the client's ethical standards and the client's culture, right? And it does vary. Okay. So the next thing I would turn to is in the formation of the representation, and I call it when it starts to get weird. Well, if you get a bad feeling coming in, there is an old saying, the number one rule of holes is to stop digging, right? Uh, there are certain triggers that will uh, guide you in knowing if it's getting weird. Um, but if you get those signals in the beginning, uh, I would urge you to reflect upon whether this relationship is a desirous one, right? For all parties concerned, but you know, for you particularly, right? And so what I say is watch what they do unto others, all right? So if you're asked to take over a matter in which they haven't paid their prior firm or they're suing their prior firm or you're the fourth law firm on the matter, uh, look, people who sue lawyers, sue lawyers, okay? So don't think it couldn't happen to you. Um, so that's, that's, that's a real important point. Uh, the other thing that I would say along those lines is, uh, if it gets ugly, if you think you're being compromised uh, in your relationship with a client, 
you simply have to withdraw. You got to do it. You have to do it in specific ways that don't prejudice the client. Uh, we'll talk about noisy versus silent withdrawals, but I would wholeheartedly urge and recommend that if it seems like the client's goals, behavior, culture, ethics, desires, etc., are not something you wish your name attached to, just withdraw. Your representation is worth a lot. Your, your reputation is worth a lot more than just one matter. So, in litigation, uh, we think about complaints and the filing and the merits of claims, right? Um, you have to be careful to make sure you actually believe in the claim, that it's not some kind of nonsense, that it's not being pursued for an improper purpose, that it's not contrary to you or your organization or your law firm's ethical and cultural standards. Because if it is, that representation won't work. And believe me, there's always some clown out there who will file it for them. It just doesn't have to be you. So that's just something to reflect upon. Strategic lawsuits against public participation fall into that category. Uh, we call them slap suits here in California. Uh, my recollection is about uh, close to 30 states have anti-slap uh, lawsuit provisions. Uh, the way they generally work is uh, a classic slap suit is a suit desired, uh, initiated to suppress speech, uh, particularly on a matter of public importance. So by way of example, uh, an advocacy group will sue a developer because they don't want something being developed, and the developer will sue them for their protests or conduct or whatever. Well, the trouble with that is uh, what the advocacy group is doing, uh, right or wrong, factually doesn't matter, is what we call speech, right? And it's protected conduct, right? And uh, in the marketplace of ideas under the First Amendment, you're allowed to protest things within various strictures that we won't go into. Uh, and if your client wishes to sue somebody over something that falls within an anti-slap law, the first thing that happens is uh, the defendant will file a motion and discovery will be stayed. All proceedings will be stayed until the hearing. Uh, and if you and your client lose, you get to pay the other side's attorney's fees. And uh, if you fall into that trap, the next thing that happens is the client, who's now less than thrilled, sues you for filing the case. So I'd be very careful of uh, making sure you understand if there is an anti-slap law in your jurisdiction and uh, what conduct, litigation conduct, falls within it. Another thing that you often see along the same lines, and clients love this concept because they often don't know the law, right? It's not their fault, they're not lawyers, but you are. Um, threatening criminal prosecution to obtain a civil advantage is unethical under the standards of every jurisdiction that I know of, and it's certainly uh, unethical under the model rules uh, and the model code, and you simply can't do it. Now, threatening criminal prosecution to obtain a civil advantage um, makes terrific logical sense because it might work. Well, antitrust conspiracies also work, but I don't recommend those either. So you have to be very mindful of that. It's a serious problem. People fall into it. The next thing in terms of initiating a suit or any proceeding um, is abusive venue selection. And you don't want to be a participant 
in that kind of con, con uh, in that kind of conduct. Uh, some of the classic cases that I can think of involve, for example, and by the way, this goes for corporate attorneys setting up agreements, goes for litigation attorneys. Um, what you would see in the past is a company that, uh, one case I can think of is a company that did uh, loans to consumers and the uh, loan agreement varied in the terms and conditions required that venue was in the, uh, if I remember correctly, the state of Virginia. Um, that's a bit of a problem when you're a consumer and you live in California and you've got a small loan and you get sued in Virginia. And the California courts have had no problem saying that that is an abusive litigation uh, um, uh, practice. And you don't want to be a party to that. Uh, ditto for another case involving uh, for-profit um, uh, college or trade school, I can't recall what. They would sign people up in the uh, county of San Diego, but they would have to uh, arbitrate any dispute in another state. And the court said no, unconscionable. Um, if you're a party to one of those, uh, it's not just the client's problem, it's also your problem. You don't want your name on the opinion uh, declaring the conduct unconscionable. So you need to really make an effort if you're presented with a situation where you're being asked to enforce a venue provision uh, or to draft a venue provision that could be viewed as abusive. Okay. Improper service and misrepresentations. I am of the strongest hope that nobody um, watching today would engage in this, uh, but you obviously have to be entirely truthful about how a complaint is served how a demand for arbitration is served, and you don't make any misrepresentations on the uh, declarations of service. There was um, a nasty old saying in uh, New York State for as long as I can remember about something called sewer service, which is you take the complaint and you stick it in the sewer because that's where the other guy lives. No, we don't do sewer service. So that should go without saying. All right. Other places where you often see bad ethical practices in litigation. Uh, discovery practice is very abusive sometimes, uh, depending on the law firm and the lawyers involved. I've seen this on many occasions. Um, I had a fine trial court judge years ago who once referred to a fine law firm's associate as a, quote, discovery expert, end quote. And he did not mean that in a good way. Um, this lawyer had had the um, courtesy of sending over a stack of written discovery that literally went two and a half feet tall when stacked. Well. I wasn't happy, so brought a motion to quash. My team brought a motion to quash. And all I had to do to avoid that discovery is bring it into the courtroom, put it on counsel's table, my table. Judge comes in, wants to hear me on the motion to quash, and I said, Your Honor, and I pointed to the stuff, and I said, This is what was served. Really? and the judge was somewhat less than pleased, okay? So, uh, and the judge made his position to the other side rather clear, and I didn't have to answer any of it. Um, so, you don't wanna go overboard in discovery. Uh, the same thing counts, by the way, for uh, meet and confer correspondence. Uh, these, so-called discovery specialists are experts at writing enormously long meet and confer letters that go on and on and on and on and on. And all they do 
is they burn client money on both sides. Um, so one hopes that we as ethical lawyers won't engage in creating needless make work. Uh, although I will acknowledge that I do uh, run into lawyers who do this, right? But it doesn't further the client's interests. The meet and confer correspondence has its place and then it has its no-fly zones, right? So don't let somebody go overboard. Discovery for improper purposes. Another thing you see quite often, you might have parallel proceedings, parallel cases, and somebody will take discovery in one to try to use it in another. Maybe they'll take it in one venue and then have it and try to use it in another. Um, that's really not according to Hoyle. Um, see, what happens often is one jurisdiction might permit certain types of discovery that the other jurisdiction wouldn't. And so people attempt to circumvent the rules of the prohibiting jurisdiction by using a parallel proceeding somewhere else uh, to obtain information, usually documents. It can be other things. And that, at least in my view, is unethical behavior. And it's an abuse of the, uh, abuse of the court system. Motion practice. Uh, what I would suggest is the total candor and honesty with the court about what the motion involves. I don't care if it's a motion to dismiss or a motion for summary judgment or a motion to compel discovery or whatever kind of motion, temporary restraining order application, whatever. Um, you will live and die on your reputation. And if you misstate the facts of the law, first of all, shame on you. Second of all, if you get caught, right, by the other side, and I will catch you, um, the judge won't forgive you. You'll never win another motion in the case. I have seen this play out many times. So there actually are ethical requirements involved in motion practice. And you won't find them stated, well, you'll find them in some bar associations and some jurisdictions codes of conduct. Um, but the essential unifying theme is candor and honesty, honesty of the facts, honesty of the law, adherence to the local rules in all aspects, right? Um, first of all, you're not serving your client well. Uh, if you do any, anything less, right? Second of all, you're damaging your professional reputation. And I guess what I'd add on that subject is, if your client insists on unethical behavior or behavior you view as unethical, then you have an obligation to refuse. And we'll go back to what I said, if necessary, withdraw. Um, a, cat, a footnote on that. If you are unsure at any stage of the representation as to whether what you're considering doing or being asked to do is or is not ethical, uh, almost every, well, frankly, every uh, state bar association that I know of in considering discipline takes into account whether you consulted independent ethics counsel. Most firms have them, outside counsel. If before you make a move at any stage, corporate or litigation, right, if you are unsure about whether something could be unethical, a mitigating factor always is if you consulted outside counsel and obtain their opinion before acting. 
always the case. Um, if you don't have the luxury of being at a large firm that has an independent ethics council outside, uh, it can be as simple as consulting with a few experienced attorneys whom you know and getting their opinion. It can be that easy. Uh, like that old uh, television show, um, use a lifeline, phone a friend, right? And then I would suggest that after you phone the friend or friends, friends are better than friend, uh, that you write yourself a little note to the file about having made the call. I'll leave it to you um, what to uh, include in that note. Um, so anyway, that's just a, that's just a hint. Settlement negotiations. Uh, next topic, another place where you often get unethical behavior. Now, the duty of candor still applies, at least in my view, in settlement negotiations. Duty of candor, simply put, is lawyers are not allowed to lie, right? Um, then we have the concept of the mediation privilege. And it's generally, at least in California, an absolute privilege that what goes on in mediation cannot be divulged. Well, I am not sure that's a panacea. Um, and it's certainly no, uh, no excuse for, um, for um, violating the duty of candor, in my opinion. I recall a situation in which a case was being resolved uh, in mediation, and it reached a mediation, I mean, it reached a settlement, right? And then the mediator, a very fine person, uh, contacted one of my partners the following day and said he was troubled because he'd learned during the mediation that the plaintiff had died. Our side didn't know that. And so the amount of our settlement um, took into account future needs, pain and suffering and things, and, and, and those die with the plaintiff, right? Um, so this mediator was perturbed enough to let us know the following day. It would have been nice if he let us know at the mediation. I wasn't there, but in any event, um, it won the mediator no friends in a firm of almost 500 lawyers. Uh, obviously, he was in a bad position, but what should he have done? In my view, he should have immediately consulted ethics counsel at his mediation organization, which I shall not name. So I'm of the view that uh, the duty of candor applies even in a mediation and uh, notwithstanding the um, concept of uh, so-called absolute mediation confidentiality. All right, so in the initial stages of any representation, what I wanna talk about now is ethics when working with clients. The first thing you have to say to yourself is when presented with a potential matter, it's competency. Do you have the skill? Can you get it? Is taking the representation fair to the client? I will tell you now, I could probably, if desired, become an expert in bankruptcy law. I could probably, if desired, become an expert in admiralty law. But I'll tell you this, I'm not setting foot in a bankruptcy court by myself without a true bankruptcy specialist. Why? Because I don't have the skill. Can I get it? Yeah, but I don't have the time. Would doing it by myself be fair to the client? No way. Admiralty, God. I mean, I understand the concept of rest and cure, as they put it, but no chance am I appearing on that. Uh, I'm just not that person, right? And taking it on is not fair to the client. 
Okay, so further on ethics when dealing with clients. Diligence. Do you have the time to do this? I have unfortunately uh, encountered counsel who will never say no, no matter how overworked they are. And what the result is, often, is a badly handled matter and a pissed off client. And that's not a good situation for either party. If you don't have the time, you don't have the time. Congratulations, you're fully employed. Enjoy your life. Don't, 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 bite, don't bite off more than you can chew, okay? It's not fair to yourself. It's not fair to the client. Next point, consistency. When you take on a representation, be it corporate or litigation, you have to make a commitment because the client expects it, frankly, and you have to make your own internal commitment that you will stay with the matter. You'll see it through, okay? Because if you have plans to retire in six months and you're just going to refer it out afterwards, it's not fair to the client to take it without them knowing that. And so, uh, by way of a you know, life practice example, I know a very fine lawyer who has retired, a uh, trial litigator, right? Uh, and he was appointed counsel uh, by an insurer for one of my clients. And he's been retired for two years. He still works the case. He's going to try the case in a couple months. That's consistency. All right? Next major point, loyalty. Okay? Uh, are you going to further your client's interests or your own? All right? And, you know, there's all kinds of discussions about alternative fee arrangements, which I am, uh, I am suspicious of in most cases. Um, I can tell you personally, I have probably talked my clients out of $100 million in fees to me by telling them they just shouldn't do something. Don't do it. Don't bring that suit. We're going to lose it. you got to be honest. That's loyalty, okay? Uh, it may not be what the client wants to hear, um, but it's your obligation, I think. And it also results in no hurt feelings, no malpractice lawsuits, no claims against the firm. I will tell you that I do know lawyers who will take a molehill and turn it into a mountain and profit handsomely from it. Well, that's not fair to the client. That's an issue of loyalty. So I offer that for your consideration. Confidentiality, another major ethical issue. You have to be mindful of obligations, not just to the client, but also to third parties. There are many requirements now for information that must be redacted from any publicly filed documents. You have to be mindful if there are minors involved. And I can tell you from experience, it is a real pain to file stacks of documents under seal. But that is an ethical obligation to the client uh, if the circumstances warrant it. And if you violate that, uh, uh, there, 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 could be, there could be severe consequences. So turning to the concept of ethical pitfalls when litigation is commenced, uh, there are a number of things that uh, are unfortunately fairly common practice uh, that are also completely unethical. Uh, I would cite the inclusion of sham defendants uh, this is often done in an attempt to destroy diversity jurisdiction and prevent removability by the defense. So in insurance cases, you'll see a non-diverse defendant being named. It's a sham defendant often. This requires a preliminary proceeding. On the defense side, sometimes you win, sometimes you don't. But, you know, ethics require that when you name a defendant, you believe them to be actually legally responsible in whole or in part for the claim that you're making. 
Collusion between adverse parties requires another discussion. And I will not name names or cite instances. But recently reported in the press, and you'll be able to find them, are situations where, a, uh, by one example, a plaintiff class counsel uh, ginned up a preemptive class action with the agreement of the defendant. And the purpose of that was to uh, obtain, obviously, res judicata as to the class and preclude further claims by other attorneys. Um, that is not going so well for the parties involved. Uh, and it was rather a big case. We already discussed use of venue as a tool to discourage a defendant's appearance. Um, what I would just add about that is that the justice system only works if people believe in it. And if people don't believe in it, it fails, right? And with it, the rule of law fails, right? So. When you file an abusive venue, uh, you're really attempting to deny the other side access to the justice system. And, you know, the existence of the rule of law and the litigation process is steam control, right? Because in the absence of an effective due process tool for the resolution of disputes, uh, people take it to old-fashioned measures, and uh, they are not pretty. So, as a lawyer, when you engage in abusive uh, venue choices, what you're doing is basically thumbing your nose at the rule of law. And that undermines the public confidence in the rule of law, and so that is, to me, clearly unethical behavior. Uh, the next thing to talk about, and I'm sure everybody knows this, filing frivolous claims, such as pursuing claims that lack any evidentiary support, sham amendments, false allegations. Um, there are uh, some recently reported cases, right, uh, where, uh, I'm not going to name names, where one can be convicted of a felony for threatening a clearly frivolous lawsuit in order to obtain a settlement, uh, criminally liable. If you pick on the wrong bloke on the other side of that, and they happen to be connected in one way or another with the local uh, prosecutor's office, uh, the results are uh, extremely not pretty. And so it's obviously an ethical violation if it's also a felony. Um, discovery. So one of, the, one of the most ethical things I've ever seen in discovery, and I'm going to put aside Brady versus Maryland in criminal cases because that's well settled that the prosecutor has to turn over. Uh, any evidence, both in, in inculpatory and exculpatory, right? But in civil cases, it is my desire, my practice, I, I don't even wait for the discovery requests in a lot of cases. I open the files as to what is non-privileged and theoretically relevant, and I just ship it over. That's the old school way to do it. You give them the documents. Facts are stubborn things. It saves your client a ton of money, right? It's transparency. But if we need a rule, we do have Model Rule 3.4. It states, among other things, and this is in the context of fairness to opposing counsel and opposing parties, that a lawyer shall not, and I quote, unlawfully obstruct another party's access to evidence, end quote, new quote, falsify evidence, end quote, or quote, knowingly disobey an obligation under the rules 
of a tribunal, end quote. And Model Rule 3.2 states, and its, its intention is to deter obstructionist tactics, it states, quote, a lawyer shall make reasonable efforts to expedite litigation consistent with the efforts of the client. So concept being, you know, there's a saying, justice uh, delayed is justice denied. Uh, there are some practitioners who use the discovery process uh, to delay purposefully. Um, and that's inconsistent with the uh, tenor and spirit, and in some cases, the language of the uh, codes of conduct. Uh, written discovery. Overuse of objections with no relation to request. Refusal to answer appropriate discovery responses. Improper purposes. We already talked about the so-called discovery experts and derivative use. Um, and so those are all fairly obvious. But um, the goal of litigation is to achieve a determination on the merits in a way that's as efficient as possible. And uh, discovery abuse, like my two and a half feet of discovery, uh, thank you, I won't name the law firm, uh, that's unhelpful uh, to either side's interests, frankly. It was unhelpful to me, sure didn't help their client. So, depositions, another example. Uh, one of my favorites, uh, and this was only a month ago, uh, on cross, I asked a witness, do you have any reason to believe that X, Y, or Z? And the opposing counsel had a conniption and said it lacked foundation. Well, I can't think of a question less lacking in foundation. Do you have any reason to believe is seeking the foundation? So it's just silliness. Um, also in depositions, overuse of objections. Speaking objections are really quite obnoxious and uh, can be the subject of another presentation on another day. But uh, the witness gets to testify, the lawyer doesn't, right? Intimidation or bullying of a witness. Uh, and some clients want this. And you can't do it, right? You certainly can't go overboard. I've seen clients who want to be present at the deposition and they want to see their, the deponent's you know, uh, body roasted over the coals. Well, can't really do that. I recall a deposition I had once I'm representing the witness. The first question was, Miss X, is it not true that during the years 1984 through 1990, you were a high-paid prostitute in Mexico City. Well, what the hell is that relevant to? Uh, I mean, it's not a crim and falsy thing, even if it were true. Uh, you know, so it doesn't, I mean, somebody who acts in, the, in that profession, it, it doesn't bear on their credibility. It, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a lie or a misrepresentation. And we're gonna start with that? That's gonna be our opening question? Isn't that lovely? Um, another example of deposition abuse, improperly instructing witnesses not to answer a question. In each jurisdiction, there are very limited uh, bases for instructions not to answer. Uh, generally, to summarize, uh, if the answer would require the violation of uh, privilege, marital privacy, political uh, voting, you can't ask somebody who they voted for, um, those sorts of things. Other than that, you don't get to do it, right? And it's just gonna need to learn, to, to lead to more motion practice, more wasted money, more time, more expense. Uh, another deposition and uh, tactic that you see sometimes from some practitioners that I also view as unethical is um, deliberately running up 
the other side's tab um, by insisting, for example, that the witness has to travel from some exotic location and will only appear if you pay first class airfare and so on and so forth. Now, another, uh, in my opinion, unethical deposition practice is deliberately frustrating the ability to take a deposition. And in an important enough case, uh, my meet and confer letters have been simple. I will take Mr. Bloke's deposition on any day, at any time, at any place in the world within the next 30 days. It's kind of hard to argue with that. If you want to have it in, 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 in Antarctica, I'm your guy. I'll be there. Okay. Uh, deposition objections. Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 30D1 says any objections must be stated concisely and in a non-argumentative and non-suggestive manner. Right? And going back to what I said earlier, it also states that instructions not to answer can only be made when necessary to preserve a privilege or to enforce a limitation uh, directed by the court or to present a motion under 30D4. And there is a fine case from the Southern District of New York, uh, Morales v. Zondo, 204 Federal Rules Decisions 50, that says, and I quote, detailed objections, private consultations with the witness, instructions not to answer, instructions how to answer, colloquies, interruptions, ad hominem attacks are all violations of Rule 30 and uh, may lead to sanctions. So, turning the page to uh, other ethical obligations, legal writing involves many. So you have the basic parts of a brief, right? You've got your facts, your legal authority, and your argument. When you're presenting the facts, you have an obligation to present the actual facts. Misstating or stretching facts? No. First of all, I'll catch you. Second of all, it won't go well for you. Third of all, it's an ethical violation. Okay? And there's a California case that states, and I quote, half the truth is often as misleading as outright falsehood. End quote. Right? So, those to me are unethical uh, practices, and it sort of goes back to the issue of credibility. And uh, credibility, once it's lost, is lost forever. And that applies, it doesn't do your client any favors, and it certainly doesn't do you any favors. Um, legal authority and argument in briefing or an oral argument. Uh, you have an obligation of honesty, right? And we do, not just you, me, okay? So what's the accurate legal standard that applies? Misquoting cases, you see it constantly. Reliance on the head notes. Uh, I was at a wonderful argument in the Second Circuit decades ago where uh, one of the lawyers had... Uh, cited a case, and um, one of the judges said, where does that appear in the case? I did not find that in the case. And the lawyer said, well, it's not in the case, it's in the head note. Well, um, you can't cite a head note for God's sake, right? And uh, then I have on my notes here, reliance on someone's brain-dead researcher who never passed the bar and is now working at Chuck E. Cheese. Um, if you're going to sign a brief, you have an obligation of accuracy. You can't point the finger at some kid that did the research, right? I also put in my notes the danger of ellipses. Ellipses in the middle of a citation are, at least to me and to some others, a warning. Maybe I'm being lied to. I'm going to take a look, right? And obvious things like failure to uh, 
to deal with adverse authority. Uh, you got to put it out there, right? It's an ethical obligation, okay? And you also might get caught, all right? Next topic, pitfalls when making a court appearance. Okay? Professional behavior at all times, that's obvious. Um, beware of making binding concessions without client approval. All right? Now, generally, under the ethical standards, uh, we have an obligation to extend courtesies to opposing counsel relating to things like extension of deadlines, minor matters like that, moving a date, for example, changing the date of a hearing. If it's not prejudicial to the client, you have an obligation to do it, right? I would be very cautious if I were in court about entering into stipulations, uh, God help us, evidentiary stipulations or the scope of the case uh, without, um, without, without getting client consent. And if you feel you may be in danger, just tell the judge, I feel like I need client consent. I'm not saying yes, I'm not saying no, but I need to consult with my client, right? Um, there's a fine case from 2015 in California, the Martinez case, um, that says when making court appearances, it's unethical to, and I quote, gratuit, well, I didn't do the lead in right, but the unethical behavior was, quote, gratuitously besmirching the character of plaintiff, right? So no ad hominem cheap shots. It, it goes to the, uh, it goes to, um, again, the belief in the court system and, and in the rule of law, right? So there's a case called Mammoth Mountain Ski Area versus Graham, a 2006 California case, uh, that cited, and I will quote, a serious mischaracterization of the record occurred at oral argument. Another quote. Recently, some appellate counsel appearing at oral argument in this court have found it convenient to misrepresent the state of the record, whether it is to try to gain some advantage on the assumption that judges will take what counsel says at face value, or perhaps because they are reckless with the truth, it places an additional burden on the court, end quote. And the Court of Appeal, uh, in this case, notified the state bar to consider disciplinary action. Now, I will leave uh, to the viewers their own personal views on the competency of the California State Bar to take disciplinary action on anything. But uh, the point of the matter is, under our California Business and Professions Code 6068D, it requires lawyers to employ for the purposes of maintaining the causes confided to him or her, those means only that are consistent with the truth and never to seek to mislead the judge or any judicial officer by an artifice or false statement of fact or law. Translation, it's unethical for lawyers to lie. It's really simple. You then get into the interesting question of what happens when your client intends to lie. Um, I will tell you about a pro bono matter that I had years ago uh, where the client uh, had a version of the facts that uh, we accepted at face value. We had no reason not to. Uh, and they were presented to us with uh, what appeared to be the utmost sincerity. And then during preparation for trial, one of our paralegals who was conversant in another language uh, did something that had never occurred to me to do. Uh, and he swore her in. Well, she apparently took the oath seriously because for the first time in over a year and a half of representation, she told the truth. Well, that wasn't good. I mean, it's good that she told the truth finally. 
kind of put me in a tough position because she was our trial witness, right? So what do you do when you have a witness who might lie, right? Well, you can't put them on the stand. You simply can't do it. You have an ethical obligation not to put somebody on the stand whom you know is going to lie. And so in those situations, you have a real tension, right? between the duty of confidentiality, the duty of loyalty to the client, and the duty of candor to the tribunal. So what do you do? Well, I couldn't put her on the stand. There's no chance. I'm not going to sit there and question her. I mean, no. Um, miraculously, we obtained a... Uh, we obtained a judgment after opening statement by the other side, uh, but it was um, uh, it was a little bit of luck there. Uh, there's an old joke that pro bono is Latin for never, never again, but no, I don't really mean that. Um, criminal cases, same thing. This could be the subject of an entirely different lecture. Uh, you have an obligation to withdraw if you know your client is going to lie. Uh, you also still have your duty of loyalty and confidentiality. And then the question comes down to whether it's a noisy withdrawal or a silent withdrawal, right? Um, some jurisdictions, interestingly, if you are in a criminal matter and you know that your client is going to lie, lucky position to be in, you have an obligation to allow the perjuring defendant to testify falsely, but you have an obligation also not to assist them in that testimony. It's, it's really quite a fascinating, uh, quite a fascinating area. And you know, it comes down to cultural attitudes towards authority and towards the truth. I worked a number of cases in my career involving people who had made false statement statements on applications for insurance, right? Health insurance in this case, this was pre-Obamacare, right? And, um, you know, so the insurer would rescind the policy and there would uh, often be a lawsuit over that. And so we would do jury research. It was absolutely fascinating. It, it, you know, you learn more in this line of work you learn fascinating things about human behavior. Oh my, about eight, over 80% of the shadow jurors we polled said two things. If they or a relative of theirs needed insurance coverage and didn't qualify, they would lie on the application. Point two, the same group, almost to a man, said, and if I were caught and they took the insurance away, I would understand. It's very interesting stuff. It's very interesting stuff that you learn in this, right? Ethical pitfalls in settlement negotiations, all right? This is a very dangerous place uh, to get. Uh, the, the largest ones that I've noted um, that I offer for your consideration Failure to communicate settlement offers to a client. Uh, that's probably per se legal mal in my view. Failure to represent the actual terms of a settlement offer to a client. Not honoring a deal made during a settlement. Purposefully not including all the agreed to terms within a settlement agreement. Attempting to confirm terms that were not agreed upon. And then, of course, the question is settlement agreements that are not signed by client. Uh, this, again, could be the topic of an entire hour of ethics negotiation, I mean, ethics uh, presentation. Um, general rule is you need the client's uh, consent to a settlement either in writing on a settlement agreement or stated in open court. And if it's a deal made without them there, it's not a deal, right? 
Um, communications with client, right? There's a duty to keep the client informed, okay? All material matters. Um, the reasonable expectation of a client, the uh, codes in the case law will tell you, that uh, the client expects to be kept informed, right? And this is not limited to litigation. Uh, this is, um, applies to all areas of practice. And the best way to avoid a hostile result with a client is to keep them informed at all stages. Um, I'll turn to ethical pitfalls in trial. And these are probably well known to many of you, but see, there are protections in the law against, for example, jury selection skewering on the basis of race, race, ethnicity, or gender. I would also add to that, frankly, uh, disability, military status, uh, sexual orientation, a number of other things. I, I think that falls within the same uh, types of protections, although I don't have a case site for you. But under the Batson case and others, it's not only a violation uh, of the other party's rights, if you do this, uh, it's also an ethical violation, right? It's obvious under the Brady rule that the prosecution cannot withhold exculpatory evidence and the uh, sort of converse that we talked about earlier uh, is allowing uh, a defendant to um, present perjured testimony. Some jurisdictions require it. Know your jurisdiction, right? So, I thank you for all your uh, attention to this today. I, what I want to close with is just to point out a macro thought, which is the difference between ethical requirements and professionalism. All right? Ethical requirements are rules, right? So it's a rules versus standards kind of question, right? So ethical requirements are how lawyers must behave. They must obey these rules, and if they violate them, they can be sanctioned. And as we discussed earlier, in certain cases, can even be held criminally liable for their conduct. Certainly can be held civilly liable. <laughs> Take my word for it. The case law is rife with examples of that. So that's ethics, right? These are rules. Professionalism is a standard. It's how lawyers should behave right? Uh, it's character versus rules, right? So, you know, it comes down to how you represent yourself. And you know, it, 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 the, the, the jokes about lawyers and the people who hate lawyers, it really, really, uh, I, I, I frankly find it hurtful because I think most lawyers are terrific and have very good character and do their level best. It's always the rotten apples that color the rest of us, right? So we talked about ethics. Here's professionalism. Service to clients, the public, the administration of justice, and the rule of law, right? And that is a professional obligation that we have. And if we don't do that, we might as well retire, or go to optometry school or something, because that's what we're supposed to do, right? It comes down to issues of personal integrity and professional competence. And I would suggest that within the concept of professional integrity and competence is civility and respect. Because again, uh, without a system that the people trust, uh, there is no... Uh, mechanism for the rule of law to operate. It's based entirely on trust in the system. Uh, without, without it, uh, the system fails, right? And so, you know, in all candor, I would represent that we all have an obligation, and there are countless, 
cases and articles and stuff saying this, that we work together as a team to uh, foster respect for the profession, uh, for the system, and uh, for the preservation of the rule of law. I want to thank you all for your time. I appreciate you all very much.